Welcome to Expedient Means with Lin Weiwei on Tom Monk Radio. Lin currently resides in China and is a founder and head teacher of Guizhen Philo Cultural Society. He has extensive experience in Buddhist and Taoist meditation, qigong, martial arts, and traditional Chinese medicine. To learn more about Lin, please visit his website at www.guizhenhui.net. Tonight, Lin will be continuing his commentary on the Tao Te Ching, chapters 41 through 50. Welcome back, Lin. Good morning, Vietnam. Yeah, <laughs> so we're going to carry on with our uh, Dao De Jing commentary. Carry on, carry on. All right. I uh, uh, just wanted to let everyone know that um, I am in my office, and yes, it is an evening where students will be in and out. So yeah, and I should prepare also, for the inevitable. And I should mention I've got a, a new headset, so my audio quality may be uh, better or worse than before. So we'll see how it goes. All right. Mm. Uh, okay. I'm going to start off. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Okay, chapter 40. This is another long one. The returning is the movement of the Tao. The weak is the utilization of the Tao. The myriad things of the world are born of being. Being is born of non-being. That's it. I lied. Hello? Yeah, I think we lost you. Oh, okay. I think, yeah, I got a little... Well, that's weird. Um, I think we're going to have to start totally over again. For some reason, these chapters are not numbered correctly on my thing. You said number 41? Oh, sorry. I read number 40. Oh, okay. <laughs> my bad. Hang on. We'll just – I'll start over here. So I guess it is a longer one. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll go to 40. <laughs> so, and you know what's really messed up too? Chapter 41 and 42 my commentary I wrote is not – is missing. It's totally not here. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I have no fucking clue why. I save it every single day. Like, I leave it on and I keep saving my shit every day. And it's just totally not on. Okay, well, let's... Uh, you Can we to... start literally from the very beginning? Yeah, yeah. Just a sec. Okay. Damn, I got a wing, number 41 and 42. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be all right. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. I had finally just mastered that intro, too, and now I'm going to butcher it <laughs> more times. All right. Let's start. Okay, man. Welcome to Expedient Means of Lin Weiwei on Time Monk Radio. Lin currently resides in China and is the founder and head teacher of Guizhen Philo Cultural Society. He has extensive experience in Buddhist and Taoist meditation, Qigong, martial arts, and traditional Chinese medicine. To learn more about Lin, please visit his website at www.guizhe. NHUI.net. Tonight, Lin will be continuing his commentary on the Tao Te Ching chapters 41 through 50. Welcome back, Lin. Hello, hello. All right, hopefully, we can just do this perfectly the first time and not have to re record it because you know how that's, that's not very <laughs> that's funny when that happens. You know, for instance, <laughs> somebody reads the wrong chapters and such. Oh, uh, right, right. And then all of a sudden, like, all of the person's uh, information just disappears. <laughs> no, that would never happen to us, would it? No, I'm sure it wouldn't. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm going to start off reading uh, chapter 41. Okay. It's pretty short, so, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Higher people hear of the Tao. They diligently practice it. Average people hear of the Tao. They sometimes keep it and sometimes lose it. Lower people hear of the Tao. They laugh loudly at it. If they do not laugh, it would not be the Tao. Therefore, a proverb has the following. The clear Tao approaches un- appears unclear. The advancing Tao appears to retreat. The smooth Tao appears uneven. High virtue appears like a valley. Great integrity appears like a disgrace. Encompassing virtue appears insufficient. Building virtue appears inactive. True substance appears in, in, uh, inconstant. The great square has no corners. The great vessel is laid in completion. The great music is imperceptible and sound. The great image has no form. The Tao is hidden and nameless, yet it is only the Tao. That excels in giving and completing everything. Yummy. Yeah, I like that chapter. I do, actually. I, I really favor this chapter, too. Um, people may see the first several lines or the first portion uh, of this and say, wow, there's a, how do I say this in English? Um, a class, you know, there's a lower average, you know, higher people, lower people, middle range people and capacity. But actually, that's just explaining 
uh, basically how people relatively have put things out there, and then basically how re- relatively have pe- how people have uh, made society. Okay, so he's using the similar ways of uh, basically he's using the language that people recognize, but then he's also pointing in later on uh, on that first part of the first stanza. Um, how it has nothing to do with class, has nothing to do with status, has everything to do with one's discriminating mind, has everything to do with uh, what we actually, uh, what's the word here? Damn, I, I, I keep forgetting my English, even the most basic stuff sometimes. He's basically saying that you have the capacity to understand, you're not going to understand, but you think you'll do so, you apply yourself so much, and then you'll miss it. When you don't have the capacity to understand, you may not even bother looking. You won't have the affinities to actually realize. Uh, when you have the capacity to understand then, and you apply yourself, but you don't grasp, you don't discriminate on what it is that you're actually understanding, then it's, it becomes almost all like a, a, like a game almost. It's just it's all relative. Oh, this thing happened and that thing happened. That's not the world. That's just the things that we throw out there. So he's really pointing at the discriminating mind in the first section here. Even maybe false thinking to the point that our thinking sometimes can become so skewed that we think the exact opposite of, of what reality, for the lack of a better term, uh, should be, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And when we get further down into the next several chapters, he's really going to look at that. And we are really going to you know, take a take a, a point to point this out um, as we go further on yeah, in chapters 44 and on. It, it gets very specific um, with false thinking and with grasping and stuff like that. You know, so this first portion, of the first passage here, or um, a stanza, is pointing at you know false thinking, discriminating mind, and and stuff like that. Uh, and we go further. Therefore, proverb has the following: the clear Tao appears unclear, the advancing Tao appears to retreat, smooth Tao appears uneven, high virtue appears like a valley, so on and so forth. Uh, and at the end is really good because he says that yet it is only the Tao that excels in giving and completing everything. So, in a nutshell, uh, in a nutshell, basically he's saying the Tao pervades all directions, and then there is no direction since all directions are full. Okay, that original nature, that original way, the way that is not with our own notions and concepts and, and attachments and thoughts and emotions and, and whatnot, uh, that way is everywhere. And since it's everywhere, it is nowhere because if something is already fulfilled or fulfilling everything, then there's nothing it's not fulfilling. Therefore, its relative uh, manifestation does not exist. So if everything is hot water, then there's no such thing as cold water and hot water isn't even hot. It's just the way that is. If there's nothing to relatively up make it uh, different, okay? So when, it, when the Tao looks uh, uh, or appears to um, the, 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 the forward Tao, the uh, advancing Tao appears to retreat, this is people's mind. This is false thinking. It appears the way it does because of our own uh, false thinking, the, our own thoughts about things. We can say it is this way. We can say it is that way. But in truth, all of it is part of Tao. All of it is part of this original thus nature of everything. Okay? Uh, it's all residing all within it. But then there's no place that it is actually residing because this original thing, this original nature, this all-pervasive Tao is everywhere. It fulfills everything, gives to everyone without a thought, good or bad. Okay, and some people would say good and bad are you know people's uh, own false thinking, their own ideas, you know. But in truth, vibr- uh, vibrationally, if we put out a negative vibration, we will attract a negative vibration. If we do something that hurts another person, it would cause pain on us as well. You know, so he's basically saying that we'll point this and we'll point that and we'll make it this way, we'll make it that way. But in truth, it is still this uh, full out original way even and, uh, i'm even looking at it thinking you know some of the very mundane extremely mundane um interpretations you could have it i mean you could see certain martial arts um philosophies in this as well right mm. you know like uh, appearing not to advance when you're advancing and uh appearing inactive when you're active you know Right. You can apply it this way too. Um, remember, we can apply anything in any way. We just have to find the right principle. So this would be considered the principle of relaxation or song. 
um, which is basically an attentive relaxation, an attentive softness where you appear to be soft uh, and yielding, but actually you are advancing on the person. You are overtaking the person. Hmm. Again, that's just a very mundane reading of it, but uh, it just goes to show that you can apply this in so many different ways. These, right. I mean, you teachings. can. We can make a commentary again. Well, I, you know, it's a long commentary, but the Tao Te Ching applied to uh, martial arts or whatever, and you can do that. But we can't leave the virtue away. You know, it can just be methods uh, utilized with this type of um, foundational teaching. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. You want me to move on? Yes, sir. All right. Chapter forty-two. A fun one. This is fun. This All is right. fun. Tao produces one, one produces two, two produce three, three produce a myriad things, myriad things backed by yin and embracing yang, achieve harmony by integrating their energy. What the people dislike are alone, bereft and unworthy, but the rulers call themselves with these terms. So with all things appear to take loss but benefit, or receive benefit but lose. What the ancients taught I will also teach. The violent one cannot have a natural death. I will use this as a principle of all teachings. Oh, I love this. And I hear a lot of, well, I used to hear a lot of how people would utilize the first several sentences um, to say how perfect and round and complete the Tao is. But actually, the first three sentences are actually telling you what it is relatively. You know, Tao produces one. Okay, what the hell does that mean? One produces two, two produces three, three produces a myriad things. All this is saying that when you have one thought, there's a ripple. Okay, you throw a stone in the water, there's a ripple, and you get so many ripples that reach throughout the whole pond or all the water or whatever you're throwing a stone into. Just take this as the mind. You put a specific thought, you add a little emotion to it, a little intent. Um, you, you put in a little bit of greed, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, maybe a love, a little happiness, whatever. And you start creating a multitude of different types of experiences, whether they're with the senses, uh, which is the you know, six senses, uh, or they are something that comes from outside, meaning something that other people impose on you, which, of course, you would then be accepting it and filtering it through your own senses anyway. So this is going relatively, telling you what happens in, in the course of manifesting things or as things are said to be manifest. And the, uh, I guess the Tao, too, would be a state of non-separation, right, where everything is, is one or even beyond one. One might not even be a valid description of the Tao. It's, it's even before one, right? Well, this would be like uh, explaining the one and the zero. The one is the interdependence of everything, uh, and the zero is the overall void of everything or emptiness of everything. Yet at the same time, both are the same. And both are one. Why is why do I say they they're the same in one? Well, here talking on emptiness and interdependence, it, it, it takes a lot of. Uh, it's a very fine line I'm walking. So, you know, just take my what I say with a little grain of salt here. Uh, no one grasp on what I'm going to say. Um, the overall void encompasses everything. That emptiness, that zero, is that this there is this non-discriminatory state, and it's not that one actually enters into something. Enter, entering into a void. If you enter into a void, it's no longer a void. So that's impossible to happen. Um, so talking on the void, on the zero, it means that all things are without a mark. All things are without a face, um, without a here or an er, nor there. Uh, interdependency means I do this, someone else does something else, and because of these two outcomes, uh, we create another outcome and we utilize those outcomes to interrelate with each other. And we use them with expedience and teaching uh, uh, cultivation and whatnot. What about the line, uh, the myriad things, which I guess usually in, in terms of these, these uh, writings, myriad things or 10,000 things usually just mean essentially everything, right? Um, yeah, it's whatever you think of. It's all in your mind, everything that, that comes around. And then they say backed by yin and embracing yang. So basically, mm -hmm. I, I would assume he's just saying that everything has both yin and yang to some degree in it? Relatively, yes. Okay. When there is, uh, when one jumps off the cycle of relativity, uh, then there is no such thing as deciphering a yin or a yang. It is just the way things are. 
All right. What about the uh, second stanza? So with all things appear to take loss but benefit, or receive benefit but lose. With the ancients taught, I will also teach. <laughs> the violent one cannot have a natural death. I will use this as a principle of all teachings. When we say natural death, we have to drop the concept of it being what we all assume a natural death is, you know, living up to old age and then just boom, you know, plop, you're dead. Um, people say, oh, well, a heart attack is like a natural death. No, this natural death we're talking about here is a natural death that is dis uh, not part of this karmic cycle of life and death. It is not of the mannerism of, oh, uh, I did something to someone before and then now I get sick. Uh, my negative karma is so heavy, it's so turbid that now I get sick or I've hurt someone in a past life and now I get back, I'm get i in this life and they find me and kill me or hurt me you know, and then I die from infection or whatever the case is. See, we're talking about non-karmic death here. That means a violent person, a person who is attached to greed, anger and ignorance, uh, attached to desire, um, they, they will cause more karmic afflictions which will influence their whole life experience, thus causing them to shorten their lifespan. When our minds are purified, and do the aspect when I say purified, meaning not this whole angelic-like being, they're going, ah, oh, I'm angelic-like being, I'm pure. No, <laughs> it means when we are not moved by these um, uh, winds, we'll call it, uh, that move our senses, and we're not attached to these things, uh, we understand this type of principle of non-discrimination, uh, non-production, we can then awaken to these type of principles, attain some state of enlightenment, can possibly uh, refine our enlightenment to get to a higher state, thus purifying or cleaning out this karmic turbidity. And what happens is our death becomes on our choice. You want to jump on a, on a tree branch and, and hang from there and go goodbye and poof, then go ahead. Could I, I'd be curious to see what the exact meaning of the, the Chinese term is because I'm wondering if you could read that violent one cannot have a natural death as the uh, discriminating or monkey mind. You can say that too. You see, all of the people on this planet now, all six plus billion or whatever, um, okay, I can't speak for every single one of them, uh, not even the bugs and all the other types of uh, life forms out there on this planet, but generally speaking, death happens and life happens because of false thinking. Um, life and death do not exist. Why don't they exist? Because there's no such true thing as death and life. We only attach to the transformation of the passing of things. Thus, we consider something stops and something begins. If you, uh, if you identify yourself with your house, then when your roof is broken, it's your head that's broken. <laughs> when your house falls down, it's like your body had broken down. You know, but that's not the case. We live in our house, but we can leave our house. For us, our bodies are like the house. We forget we can leave the house, or we, we lost our keys. And we just you know, try to find our keys. <laughs> it's a good analogy. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do, do you want me to carry on to 43? Yes, sir. All right. This is a good one, too. I like this chapter a lot, too. The softest things of the world override the hardest things of the world. That which has no substance enters into that which has no openings. From this I know the benefits of unattached actions, the teachings without words. The benefits of actions without attachment are rarely matched in this world. Mm, really good, really good. Uh, the first four lines speak on meditation and mind. The mind, a conscious mind, false thinking mind. It's all full of thoughts, notions and views of the senses and its interrelation and interactions. Uh, this can be considered hard, you know, quote-unquote hard. The soft here is a metaphor uh, uh, for the still mind, a mind of no false thinking, no views and notions of the senses and how they interrelate in the reaction, interactions. So the stillness that is constant um, but rarely made aware of uh, is the mind of non-discrimination. Uh, that which has no substance is said to have no substance due to their being, uh, notions and views of their being a substance. <laughs> Got that? <laughs> So this yeah. points to this, yeah. <laughs> this points to the substance of the original mind, and enters that which has no openings. It refers to uh, emptiness, and we we're just speaking about that too. So the original mind, the responsive state that is said to arise from entering stillness, emptiness, is the substance. 
emptiness, void, or stillness, there are no doors for one to enter. There are no spaces in which one can distinguish it from other things. So we see, we said that just before, that if you entered a void, then there is no more void. It's full. Okay? So this thing, it, it is not a thing, nor is it a no thing, but it cannot be entered. We're just saying that too. Uh, the use of the word enter, um, you could say it was just a tool to allow one to understand what was happening. Uh, but in truth, there is no, quote-unquote, entering of a void. If so, there would be no void, right? Uh, so that which has no substance enters that which has no openings. There was never a separation between the mind and the void because it is part of the same thing. Thus, you cannot enter something which you are already part of. You can only realize that it is just that way and be at ease in the false thinking, allowing the mind to be still. And, and again, on a mundane level, this uh, chapter has really influenced a lot of martial arts styles, um, like Tai Chi, for instance, and, uh, mm. and other styles. All right, do you, yeah. want, do you want me to carry oh, on? Well, uh, no, I still have more because we're breaking down this. Okay. Um, some of the words here. Um, the benefits of unattached action. And we have that in one of the sentences. Uh, it doesn't mean to go and do what you please. No, no, I, I put a lot of focus on this one because – if I'm reading it and then I start to – I can start to think, oh, I can just do whatever the hell I want to do. I'm sure a lot of people think that too. <laughs> so it really doesn't mean that. <clears throat> and that since you are unattached, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that either. Uh, it means action is not done because there is no movement of the mind, no grasping of the senses to be coerced into doing anything. That simple non-doing is the accomplishment of all things. So don't confuse the not doing of something as just sitting there absolutely, absolutely just sitting there twiddling your thumbs. <laughs> you know, applying the mind in deep concentration, uh, purifying one's mind through the means of single-minded focus. Uh, this is doing and non-doing simultaneously. Uh, thus, they cancel each other out, and uh, one is left without being left. So when wis then when wisdom se uh, seeps in. Um, of course, it, it was never lost or never not there, right? It, it just seeps right in. It just is as though you cr you made a crack in the doorway and now this light is pouring through. Uh, this is uh, the quote-unquote the teaching without words. The benefits of the actions without attachment. So are really matched in the world. You know That means this uh, accomplishment of mind, of beings, whatever one feels comfortable calling it, you know, it is unsurpassed. There is nothing higher than this. Like, really unmatched simply means, well, many want to be first. When they get to the breaking point, they must put down their attachments of self in order to actually make it. And thus, when they do make it, uh, they realize there is nothing more, nothing to compete for, and nothing to be first. All are first. So so what what this line is saying is that uh, with unattached actions, you can do basically anything like you can run down the street with a samurai sword and start hacking people up as long as you're unattached, right? That's what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just toying with you. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've, I've seen this, um, these, the, that kind of um, uh, expression. Uh, spoken of because of some chapters in the Tao Te Ching. It's like, it doesn't matter. I can go and kill anybody I want. There's no such thing as karma. There's no such thing as this. In the overall truth of things, it doesn't matter. But if not, you're not realized in that. And you're still attached to certain things coming and going, and you're not in that realized state. So it does matter. And when you are in the realized state, those things will not happen happen you won't be running down the street with a samurai sword going yeah, 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 chopping people's heads off so theoretically when you're in a realized state you could do that but you won't do that there's no reason like you don't have <laughs> yeah any sense of that there is no death so it's like what who am i killing you know <laughs> okay it's screw, screw with people's heads for a bit um yeah. all right you want me to carry on <laughs> carry on carry on <laughs> all right chapter 44 Fame or the self, which is dearer? The self or wealth, which is greater? Gain or loss, which is more painful? Thus, excessive love must lead to great spending. Excessive hoarding must lead to heavy loss. Knowing contentment avoids disgrace. Knowing when to stop avoids danger. Thus, one can endure indefinitely. Ooh. This is this another short chapter? It's a short chapter. I love, um, I love that line, uh, excessive love must lead to great spending. <laughs> 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 no money, no honey. <laughs> I should uh, I should tattoo that one on my son's forearm when he gets older. <laughs> oh, 
would, uh, one of my friends used to tell me, no money, no honey. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so this thing speaks clearly. Um, uh, but let's go a, uh, let's just go a little bit deeper into it. I mean, it does speak very clear. I mean, it's just smack in the head, boom. But a fame self, um, you know, a, a dear, you know, what is dearer, you know, um, in the first sentence, uh, self, wealth, greater, you know, all these things that they're talking about, gain or loss, painful, all that stuff. Which of these is better? And neither. All hold a place in the cycle of relativity, you know, all result in each other eventually. So, you know, many cling to fame or reputation or fear of having a bad reputation and, and lose their dignity. You know, they fear that. Uh, many cling to the self as some higher, greater being and create further notions of superiority over others. Some simply uh, cling to a notion of the self and just say and just stay with that, still feeding the views of separation. So wealth over self, this is quite common, uh, and self over wealth is also common. Both sides of the same coin. Be basically a, a, a perception rules the Persian, and they are spun in like a whirlwind of views, uh, emotions, and, and further concepts of whatever becomes most influential to them. You know, that's what happens, and they call that life. So they base their life and their views on it just like that. The rest of the, spas the, rest of the passage um, speaks about enough, you know, about knowing how much is enough and realizing that when one begins to empower views of self, uh, they beget the myriad crazies in the world. <laughs> and that is the myriad ebbs and flows, which they seem to identify as the going with the flow. So let's not go with the flow anymore because that flow is just a cycle of relativity. Actually, you know, go with the flow. Actually, going with the flow is the non-discriminating mind, the actual going with the flow, um, the all bright mind, the wisdom mind, you know, being the overall catalyst of one of all one does. You know, not many tasted that kind of fruit. And when they do, they actually will understand. So this is why Lalza doesn't go too far in his passages intellect, intellectualizing the states that he understands and he does understand because um, he's tasted that fruit of inner wisdom. Oh, the, the more he would elaborate, the more he would probably limit himself, right? So it's, uh, I think he's done a masterful job. Yeah, the more you explain, then you have to go further to explain what you explain, and that yeah. just takes away from everything. It just creates a vicious circle. You just throw someone a bone, and hopefully they, they get to the marrow, you know? <laughs> I don't know why when I read this uh, this chapter, all I can think of is, like, I just pictures of people in Hollywood just pop into my head for some reason. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right, you want me to go to 45? 45. All right. Great perfection seems flawed. Its function is without failure. Great fullness seems empty. Its function is without exhaustion. Great straightness seems bent. Great skill seems unrefined. Great eloquence seems inarticulate. Movement overcomes cold. Stillness overcomes heat. Clear quietness is the standard of the world. Ooh, fun, fun. Great perfection refers to that which is the origin of all things, where all things are said to reside. <coughs> Excuse me. Its overall function is not seen, but what results is, you know, that what results is seen. Um, thus, living beings only see the result, never the origin, never the process. Um, due to false thinking, all that is manifest can be viewed as having faults. Now, people usually think uh, this could be better, that could be better, you know. And the overall source is never exhausted. It can't be for all, all things reside within it. Yet it holds no direction and still pervades all directions. We talked about this right in the beginning of the show. So the last few lines reflect relative concepts, basically stating uh, revolve on the cycle of relativity and you are still not getting it. <laughs> Clear quietness is basically the result of uh, non-discriminating mind. That's it? That's all you got? Damn, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> and I was hoping you had a five-minute diatribe on this one. <laughs> I have to put everyone on hold and run to the bathroom then. <laughs> I'm, I'm just playing with you. Um, do you want me to carry on? That's it? Yeah, if you have anything to say on that. If not, let's just move on. Eh, it's pretty uh, pretty straightforward, I guess. It's not one of my... I would. I don't want to say it's not one of my favorites because I, I love everything in the Dungeon <laughs> of Ching, but... Just, he didn't put much focus on that. Does it? Yeah, he was he was having his tea break when he wrote that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'll go to chapter forty six. He was cleaning his ears. For a while. <laughs> like, oh yeah, clear quite. I can hear everything really nice. Speaking of so. which, didn't uh, doesn't Lao Tzu have supposedly have quite a, quite large ears? 
Yeah, yeah. What's meaning That's that anyway? Symbol of wisdom. Oh. Large earlobes are a symbol of wisdom or having the potential for wisdom. Does it mean? Or it could just mean that you're very old. Does it mean? <laughs> does it mean you hear more? With big ears? <laughs> you know, some people with big ears hear very little. <laughs> some people with big heads, big brains, really understand very little. <laughs> All right, enough picking on Lao. I'll uh, I'll go to. The... <laughs> okay. He's, he had a big hat though. Big hats are good because you can yeah. hide, you can hide a lot of hair up there. Because <laughs> Taoists aren't allowed to cut their hair, right? So. <laughs> All right, carrying on. Yes. To chapter 46. When the world has the Tao, fast horses are retired to till the soil. When the world lacks the Tao, war horses give birth on the battlefield. There is no crime greater than greed, no disaster greater than discontentment, no fault greater than avarice. Thus, the satisfaction of contentment is a lasting satisfaction. Mm, very simple. The first line clears up the rest of the passage um, by saying when the world has Tao, uh, it means when the minds of the people of the world have been free from false thinking, greed, anger, and ignorance, then the following passage makes sense. So he speaks of being content, meaning knowing what you have and realizing that it comes from your own desires, your own mind. If one nourishes greed, then there is no contentment. Contentment isn't just being okay with what you have. Uh, it's the total absence of climbing on conditions to get what you want. So basically, you have what you have, and you make every ounce of it work for every myriad thing you wish to accomplish. When one has to begin grasping for more, they empower the idea that there isn't enough, and thus greed sets in, further influencing uh, the mind to create notions of separation. And thus it continues, it goes on and on and on that way. And then there's the obvious uh, metaphor of the horse tilling the soil, which, you know, would obviously point to cultivation, right? Uh, yes, sir. When things are at ease in this aspect and you come to some understanding, yes. You have horse. A horse in Chinese uh, culture is significant of health, healing, steadfastness, you know. Oh, I didn't also, know that. Is, yeah, and a horse is, you know, someone has, a, there's a saying, ma shang chen gong, which is the horse uh, and then Chen Gong is success. So it's like the horse is fast, right? So say, when someone asks you, are you when are you going to be coming home? You say, Ma Shang Dao. It's like, I'm coming very quickly, like I'm on my way. So when you say, Ma Shang Chen Gong, it's the horse. Or you could say the horse is bringing success or that success is coming very fast because the horse runs very quickly. Uh, that right? explains. I've got, a, I've got a Feng Shui um, statue which has a horse with a monkey on it. And uh -huh. I, I think that's what the uh, Feng Shui lady explained to me was that it, it meant success kind of coming in very quickly or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Something to do with, I, I don't know exactly what the monkey meant. I think it was a monkey anyhow. Uh, maybe it's just, you know, a monkey on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> we can give it some spiritual, you know, Feng Shui kind of idea to it. But it could just be a monkey on a horse. It could have some other cultural reasons, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was something to do with the, the the names again of the monkey was similar to the name of something else. So I don't know. It's like a, it is a Chinese feng shui metaphor. So mm. anyhow, I don't want to dwell on it. Okay. Well, yes. <laughs> Horses uh, tilling the soil is that you are um, quickly attaining uh, the, the, the skill of nourishing the fruit, nourishing the seeds to attain the fruit of wisdom. All right, you want me to go on to 47? Yes, sir. Wow, we're just plowing through the Tao Te Ching this morning, aren't we? Oh, yeah. All right. Without going out the door, know the world. Without peering out the window, see the heavenly. Sorry, see the heavenly Tao. The further one goes, the less one knows. Therefore, the sage knows without going, names without seeing, achieves without striving. This is going to be a very, very, very long explanation here. Why do I? Why do I? Doubt, why do I doubt you? <laughs> this passage refers to the illuminating the mind from within, turning the light inwards. Um, you know, taking the knots of the senses, like taking them apart, uh, unknotting the senses, thus allowing the true manner of the world to be realized. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Without uh, that line, without peering out the window, um, see the heavenly, I would almost interpret that as uh, without using the eyes, right? Without looking out the eyes. 
um, okay, you can say eyes are like a window, right? But we have to look at what is actually seen. Now, if you close your eyes and you sat in meditation, there may be instances where you have a state where you actually see what's in front of you and what's around you. But how can that be possible when your eyelids are closed? Of course, there's a different colored hue of the world in that state. <clears throat> but you can literally actually see the room you're in. Now, if you threw an intention out there to go specific places, you may possibly be able to see specific places you want to go to. So if we're unknotting the senses, then we're not opening the eyes, relying on the senses. You know, going out the door is creating outflow. So it's using our senses to experience the world. We don't have to do that. We turn our, our gaze, we turn our wisdom, our light inside. Find the uh, causes and conditions of our mind, of the things that we created in our mind, the, the attachments we have, um, the attachments to our senses, the world we base on our senses, see those origins. Then we understand them. We are not the senses. We can find the true senses and they are like no more covering themselves. Thus, you actually see what's actually the world. So the the window metaphor, what you're saying is even if you got the blinds drawn on the window, like there's still kind of – you can still see light peering through more or less? If the blinds are covering the light shining in from, from outside, physically you probably won't see any, any light coming in. Um, but as a sense of your eyelids being closed, actually you still see things. You're still seeing a darkness. You may still see colors or little specks of dust in your eyelids. You you will still see still see colors, so you're actually not blinded when your eyes are closed. And if you, well, don't do this, please, but poke your eyes out or <laughs> blind yourself, or if you do go blind, or if you are blind, um, and you have no concept of colors whatsoever, you can't say you don't see anything mm -hmm. because you really, if you're not seeing something, you're still in the state of seeing that you are not seeing. Even though the language will play on the language here, uh, in truth, the mind is not is not uh, what's the word dependent on our senses, on our physical senses. They're the, phys the physical senses are dependent on the mind, and then still, the mind though is a sense because there's a notion of there being separation. It's dependent on itself as well. It's as though it's something else in there. Most people have this like inner voice, and they're like. Oh, my higher self tells me this. My higher self tells me that. That may be just the, the conscious mind. Okay. And then we do have, um, you can say, I'm not going to say we have different selves in there, but we have a wisdom that's in our, in, in, our, in our mind. We have wisdom in there that when it is let out, it's as though there's another voice speaking. It doesn't mean you have a psych psychotic problem, <laughs> it's a psychiatric problem. It just means that you'll, you'll have a notion that there is something else in there, when actually it is all the same. Hmm. My higher voice is telling me to move <laughs> on to chapter 48. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Unless you want to say anything else. <laughs> no, it's okay. We can go on. All right. <laughs> Pursue knowledge, daily gain. Pursue Tao, daily loss. Loss and more loss until one reaches unattached action. With unattached action, there is nothing one cannot do. Take the world by constantly applying non-interference. The one who interferes is not qualified to take the world. Mm, what is your thoughts? Well, uh, trying, to think, <laughs> trying to think of how to say this eloquently. Um, Obviously, you know, less loss is loss and more loss until one reaches on attached action. I would just assume that it means cutting out false thinking to the point where, you know, you your mind is much more polished. Mm. Mm. Cool. Um, along those lines, you know, let's let's check this out. You know, that which is thought of can be spoken, heard and further developed. Right. So thus we have knowledge. Um so that is gain, meaning we can read, remember, create notions, and further intellectually understand things, creating the reality for a mind that we have achieved, developed, and gained. Now, this works on one end, but it is not complete. You know, that's worldly wisdom. More false thinking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when one investigates the Tao, one realizes that they must let go of their notions of the world, their intellect. You know, basically chopping their heads off one by one. Uh, metaphorically, though. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, so stop intellectualizing and begin realizing what is truly the quote unquote way of the world, so to say. Uh, it's really just like you said, cut out the discriminating thinking, the false thinking of the mind. And again, one of the criticisms you can see um, leveled at the Tao Te Ching and, and sometimes Taoism and Buddhism is that it's anti intellectual, or I guess I've heard that said before. Yeah, but it, you know. But in, in, in a good su- way. Well, <laughs> when you read sutras, and you learn that culture that the sutras are written in, and you learn the style of the of the way the language is used to to uh, put out the sutras, or even um, to put out the Taoist texts. Uh, when you do that, you become accustomed to it. You intellectually understand how those things are being used. Okay, then you realize the principle, the principle of non discrimination stop false thinking, and, and so on and so forth. Therefore, you know not to rely on the intellect, but you can utilize it as a tool because people utilize it as a tool. So you see, it's the fact that it is being used just for the sake of other people having to use it, which will go on. The next chapter uh, speaks exactly on this point. It's almost as though this whole thing just flows into itself. Yeah, one of the other translations, um, well, I guess, you know, there's many translations. Um, this is, again, from Derek Lin, who's Chinese and tried to make it as as pure, as close to the Chinese as possible. Um, I kind of like some of the other translations of that line a little better, like in the pursuit of learning every day something is acquired, in the pursuit of Tao every day something is dropped. Again, it's the same thing, but I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just, I like that. The way it's worded, I mean doesn't matter it's the way it's worded that then clicks for you uh that works on the intellect and then you can go further down and not rely on the worldly wisdom to actually attain wisdom because that's just worldly wisdom Mm. knowing the the going with the flow (coughs) excuse me um understanding the ebbs and flows of things that's still worldly wisdom going with your destiny following the 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 path of your your life uh, you know what you're destined for that's still ordinary that's still going with the flow that's still relative it's just still worldly wisdom. There's nothing very special. I mean, you can do I Ching readings for yourself, and uh, one could do that for themselves and find out what they're going to be doing in like five years or you know two minutes or whatever. But that's still ordinary because they're still going on the relative flow of your karma. When that changes, when you can change that at the root level, the mind ground level now you're going to be something extraordinary quote unquote because it's ordinary then we'll just say extraordinary just for the sake of saying so things become a little bit more um, quote unquote higher level at that point you can change what is supposedly to be one's destiny and then once one would say well then it wouldn't have been the destiny to change maybe one not even uh, aware of it but that could just be in their karmic um and their karmic influences that they may come across a, the path in which they can change what was supposed to be set out for them in this life. If they actually apply it, then they actually fulfill that specific thing. Is that a destiny? Well, if you're not doing anything about what's going to be happening for you, then that is your destiny. If you do something to alter or change that specific thing, it's going to take a lot of work. Just because it does end up happening doesn't mean that was the destiny you had before. It just means you did a hell of a lot of work to reroute all that karmic influence, all that karma. And it takes a lot of work. Hmm. That sounds like uh, we've got another show we could do on that all by itself. Yeah. Um, I'll just throw out the, the, the name of how that's going to go. It's going to be called the Alphans. Sushin. The Alphans Four Lessons. Okay. And um, that is directly speaking on changing one's destiny. Um, really cool. And so I'm making a note of this now. All right. So I don't forget. Okay, okay. let's move on. I will read chapter 49. Yes, okay. you will. <laughs> <laughs> the sages have no constant mind. They take the mind of the people on as their mind. Those who are good, I am good to them. Those who are not good, I am also good to them. Thus the virtue of goodness. Those who believe, I believe them. Those who do not believe, I also believe them. Thus the virtue of belief. The sages live in the world. They cautiously emerge their mind for the world. The people will, sorry, the people all pay attention with their ears and eyes. The sages care for them as children. 
Yes, and I was just saying, and when we're talking on chapter 49, that the following chapter is going to speak very good about this. Um, the first sentence uh, lays out the exact way of the rest of the passage, as the rest of these passages do, but um, specifically pointing to last, the last few uh, passages we read. And this one, it points to the no self of sages. So if one has a self, one has false thinking, thus has a mind, quote unquote, um, they live in their mind. They assume it is a reflection of the worldly ways that people have created and made up. So in order to speak, teach, and help people awaken, sages utilize the minds of people, which means they take on the likenesses that people act like and create affinities with them. Then they use those ways to teach people how to cultivate. You know, it's what it, it's what it means when it said um, that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, sages, Dharma protectors, you know, they help living beings who have affinities with them. You know, crossing over all living beings um, by means of expedience. So those expedients aren't made up by these sages. They're created by the people. The sage simply knows their mind and thus uses their conditions to help them awaken. Yeah, my my read on this is that it uh, it points to the nature of compassion too, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, those who are good, I am good to them. Those who are not good, I am still good to them. Those who believe, I believe in them. And those who do not believe, I still believe in them. So, Right. Yeah. I mean, if people want to say, well, you know, that's just a moral figure, you know, that's not really uh, the way things are. But then I'll ask, but if we're supposed to follow the greatest way of nature, then what nature are you following? If it's the mother nature, the nature of this planet, the, the energy, the, the that purified actual beingness so to say quote unquote you know of this whole planet then the air on this planet that's created by the trees and plants or whatever it gives to everybody regardless if they're good or bad no discrimination exactly so this is what it means if i'm going to or if one is going to be good to those who are bad to them it doesn't mean just give them whatever they want the good means that you're being in a manner that helps them stop be that way or helps them realize they've been that way or helps them see right in their face that they've been a specific way that is not very uh, good. <laughs> you know how else can I say So in it? other words, don't go giving heroin addicts more heroin. No, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. All right. Did you want, what, did, should we move on to the final chapter? Yeah, there's nothing more on this. Okay. All right. Coming into life, entering death, the followers of life, three and ten, the followers of death, three and ten, those whose lives are moved toward death, also three and ten. Why? Because they live lives of excess. I've heard of those who are good at cultivating life. Traveling on the road, they do not encounter rhinos or tigers. Entering into the army, they are not harmed by weapons. Rhinos have nowhere to thrust their horns. Tigers have nowhere to clasp their claws. Soldiers have nowhere to lodge their blades. Why? Because they have no place for death. Mm, nice. And uh, I'll just speak very um, superficial on one point. The first line opens the passage, setting the stage for the meaning. Being born and enduring life up till death. That's what it means. Being born and enduring life up till death. Three in ten. Hmm. Means three out of ten. Three out of ten people cling to an idea about life. Three out of ten people cling to an idea about death. Three out of ten people are pointed into the direction of knowing they will die, meaning they do things that result in their death. In their death, um, we can just speak very plain out and simple. But of course, there should be a cultural meaning to the word three and ten. Yeah, I was going to ask. <laughs> well. Uh, if we're going to the energetic cultural meaning in this aspect, uh, 10 means it's like a number for completion, um, like totally perfect. Um, three is just like uh, we'll say things happen in threes. So when things uh, are done, like if you – what's the word? Like uh, when you light up incense, you bow three times. It like proves your sincerity. Uh, some people like three incense. Some people say things three times. There's a lot of uh, historical culture where it goes into magic – um, where people, you know, recite something three times to make sure that it happens. They do something in threes or evil, bad 
situations, bad karma uh, comes in threes, you know, three different types of it happening, three different ways of it happening. So I don't know the specific um, characters that they're using here in, for this passage, the Chinese characters, nor am I aware of the cultural meaning that they placed in between the words uh, for the, the numbers of three and ten. But we can just take it at a superficial part only because it just helps us point to, uh, helps us just focus on an idea. And that's basically it. The idea here is the uh, life and death. So that's all we really need to worry about. Um, the bigger portion of this passage, which is the more important aspect of this patch passage, isn't the numbers 3 and 10. It's this idea about life and death. See, it goes, um, but those cultivating life, you know, he says, have no place for death. This is the point of this passage. This means they have no place for life which means further that they have let go of the attachments and views of a self. No life, no death. There is nothing that clings, nothing to cling to. So, you know, they are without the conditions of having to fend for their life, nor welcome death. It is just not in their mind for such a thing. Hmm. Is there any significance to say the, the specific animals they chose, the rhinos and the tigers? Um, perhaps during those times they had these animals running around. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying they had <clears throat> as a figure of speech that these are wild animals. They see something, they want to attack it. You know, they see a human, usually a human gets attacked by them. But if you don't have it in your heart that there's a fear that these beings will attack you or that there's a fear of death nor an attachment to life, then there won't be any any fear or there won't be any mannerism which they will attack you with you know when oh, i was in taishan in shandong once uh i lived there for four years um and i was climbing the mountain on one of the op opposite of the uh, usual path and uh i met a tiger i'll just say a tiger spirit um and it crept up and i felt this thing staring at me and it's very strong i looked and it was a tiger like i seen his outline of the body it had certain types of uh uh, characteristics to it um, but I saw right through it but it was an actual tiger spirit <clears throat> and I said what do you need and he says you're not afraid of me I said not at all and he says uh, well you should be <laughs> and I said is there really anything that needs to be fearful needs to be made fearful of and he says well you give me what I want and so I can be free and I can let you go I said, sure, what do you want? He goes, I need to be free. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> he just went, oh, <laughs> I only know of one way. So uh, I'll, I'll give it to you. And if it, if it doesn't help you, you know, I'm sorry. That's the only way I know. I'll probably ask somebody else or, you know, do whatever you want. And he says, no, you, you give me the way. You give me the method. And all I did was recite the Great Compassion Mantra for it, uh, recited uh, – Nam Nam Amitabha's name three times, the Great Compassion Mantra once, um, uh, gave it the recitation for um, taking refuge in the Triple Jewel, the Buddha Dharma Sangha. And he looked at me and his color, his emanation changed. And he just said, okay, thank you. And he just turned around and walked away and just vanished, literally just like vanished away. He didn't, he didn't try to claw your heart out? <laughs> no, but what happened would be most likely they would cause a sickness they can't attack you and actually rip up your skin right. in the spirit form like that unless they are cultivated where they can actually manifest something, quote-unquote, concrete in that aspect. But they would cause sickness, uh, cause, you know, inauspicious events to happen. And uh, luckily, that's the only thing I had on me was the Great Compassion Mantra that I memorized. Uh, the Shurangama Mantra is just uh, 553 or 54 lines long, you know, and... Um, I guess I was a little impatient. I didn't want to recite it then. <laughs> I just said all I could think of is the great compassion mantra. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's all I was able to think of. So, um, but that, that's just, you know, I, I really, not that I don't fear death. Um, it's not the dying that I have a problem with. It's the, the responsibility in this life that I still have, uh, uh, a, a chosen responsibility for a chosen attachment to. Especially you know, now that you've got, a, now that you've got a little guy. Yeah, you know, I have a – it's a chosen responsibility. I was like, this is what I will need to do. And um, so the action of death doesn't bother me. What's going to come after doesn't bother me, whatever it is. But it's just that I still have – I still am attached 
chosen to attach to the things I need to or chose to want to do. And it's have this family and have that little boy mm. and my wife, you know, and make sure that he's okay. One, uh, one other thing I was going to, just a thought that popped into my mind, uh, sort of where I was going when I was asking about what the animals may have symbolized. Um, you know, I hate to say <laughs> sound vulgar or anything, but the, the, <laughs> the rhino with uh, nowhere to thrust their horns kind of made me think of sexual desire. <laughs> okay. But maybe, well, if there's an, maybe that's well, just my interpretation. An, if there's an attachment to a, a view of a self, then there's going to be an attachment uh, to the views of others, uh, views of a personality, thus life and death as well. There's going to be attachment to, to desire. And hey, rhinos have no way to thrust their horns. And <laughs> <laughs> you won't have the desire to go out and, you know, if you're a man, to go and do your thing and do that thing. And if you're, for, you're a woman, then there's no way for these rhinos to actually put it. <laughs> to thrust their horns. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, we could speak very straight up. It's not vulgar at all, you know. <laughs> anyway, funny. well, that's pretty good. We got through uh, ch- 10 more chapters today. A lot of them were shorter than some of the previous ones, which I guess yeah. shorter doesn't <clears throat> necessarily mean less deep, though. But Yes, but we have about 30 more to go, right? We're, we're getting there. We're yeah, getting there. that's nice. All right, well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again uh, for, for speaking with us uh, this week, Lynn. Uh, I'm glad we can. And uh, for everyone listening, please be sure to join us next week as uh, Lynn will be discussing misconceptions of martial artists. And to quote the final chapter of the Tao Te Ching, as I always do, well, mostly. Wait, wait, wait. I got a question. All right. Are we going to, after we finish the actual whole Tao Te Ching, uh, Tao Te Ching uh, commentary and we finish chapter 81, are you still going to recite the chapter 81? Yes, but I'm going to recite it back. <laughs> awesome. From the okay, bottom just up. Just to put it out there. <laughs> All right. The sage does not accumulate. The more he assists others, the more he possesses. The more he gives to others, the more he gains. Thank you.